Let's enjoy the talks. So the first speaker is Jorge Gonzalez Cazares, who is also a co-organizer of the program. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's from uh, at UNAM and will be speaking uh, about heavy tails and regular variation. Please, Jorge. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, yes, uh, let's remember that should any research come out of this program, we should all be very thankful to the INI. Uh, it's just a, a, a short <laughs> acknowledgement in the end. It will be very helpful just to keep track of who, uh, who was impacted by the, by the problem with Paul. Um, it doesn't cost anything, right? So I think it's, it's okay if we can all do that. Uh, if anyone considers that the time spent here helped the research. And uh, yeah, well, thanks. Uh, thank everyone for, for coming here. Uh, my first talk would be about a very general topic. Just uh, heavy tails and regular variation, which is like a, something many people will already know, but hopefully will also set the ground for people to be able to work on, on these fields, right? So this is such a central uh, theme, uh, theme in uh, many of the talks that will come. Uh, so uh, the, the central reference for this topic, I guess, is the work of uh, Nick Bingham with uh, Goldie and Fergals. Uh, and many other works by Bingham as well, and uh, all the authors, actually. And uh, it goes back to the theory of uh, Karamata. So first, uh, let us consider this functional equation, which is essentially like a linear functional equation. Right? Like what, what's a linear function in some sense? Well, uh, if you subject the solution H to be, let's say, measurable or have the bare property or some such regularity, then it turns out that the unique solution must be a linear function, right? So C times X for some uh, real C, possibly C. Yes. Okay. Analogous to this problem is this uh, unique solution uh, or unique measurable solution to the functional equation, H of X times H of Y is equal H of X times Y. This is known, uh, well, one of these, and maybe both of them are known as this Cauchy problem. Okay, uh, if you don't assume the function or the solution to be measurable, then you can find very pathological looking uh, solutions. But since uh, in measure theory or in probability, we usually at least assume measurability. I don't think this is a, I mean, this regularity is much to ask, right? And uh, in, the, in the case of the, in the multiplicative case, it turns out that the unique solution is essentially a power function uh, where, of course, x to the power zero means a constant one, okay? Now, uh, the reason why this is interesting is because this comes up in this uh, ob central object of study in regular variation, which is the, the function, positive uh, measurable functions, such that uh, this limit exists here as you take x to infinity for any positive lambda, okay? This limit, usually just a function of, of lambda, but under these regularity assumptions, it turns out that h itself is also measurable, and therefore, uh, if you apply this relationship for, let's say, two, uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2, you work out some common quotient, and it turns out that H solves the second Cauchy problem, and therefore must be a power function, right? That is, uh, it, it, H must look like something like X, X to the alpha, uh, or lambda to the alpha, I guess, if you substitute love, uh, lambda there. <laughs> and uh, this is why it's called regularly varying, and this alpha index will be like somehow the the main member, the main uh, ob object, or somehow the, the real number that represents the variation. Okay. And when alpha is zero, we say that the function is slowly varying. Why? Because the limit turns out to be one for any lot. Okay. So in fact, a historical remark is that uh, this limit uh, for alpha equals zero was first studied in the, in the, uh, in the field of number theory because people were wondering about the distribution of primes of some functions of primes, right? And uh, even though this convergence, we'll, we'll see that later that the convergence is somehow uniform in some sets, uh, lambda sets, so to speak, it can be very, very slow. Uh, and it will all depend on, on the slowly varying part of this, of this function, okay? <laughs> uh, this may affect so quite substantially, the convergence of, of many objects in probability. Okay, so for now, let's just give some examples of slowly varying functions. Okay, so uh, some of these functions include log, of course, log log, one over log, one over log log, 
all of these functions. Uh, even this function, uh, which is uh, the exponential of square root log times cosine of square root log, which in fact uh, oscillates so much that the limit is zero and the limit is infinity, right? So it need not have a limit, uh, zero or infinity. <coughs> The, the only point is that this quotient should, should go to zero, uh, should go to one, and that's why it's called uh, slowly varying. Okay. So it's a, uh, uh, if we denote the class of regularly varying functions of index alpha by R alpha, it is somehow easy to see that this function here, which is essentially X to the minus alpha times F of X, will be slowly varying. Okay, we've essentially drawn out the power function that the, that the regularly varying function had, or in other words, f of x is equal to x to the alpha times some slowly varying function l. Now, again, the slowly varying function l could be constant, could converge to a positive finite constant, could go to zero to infinity, or simply fluctuate, right? Between zero and infinity, or between positive numbers, it can do many different things, okay? There are many pathological examples. And uh, the first result in this, uh, Area. There's again a study by Karamata's uh, representation theorem, and it states that for any slowly varying function L, uh, it's essentially an initial constant and the exponential of an integral of a function that goes to zero divided by y. Okay. So the function here, epsilon of x uh, of y, can uh, needs to go to zero, but that's essentially the only condition. It also needs to be measurable, but it can be positive or negative. So for example, if the slowly varying function L is eventually monotone, then epsilon of X will eventually have a sign, right? Eventually be just positive or negative, okay? And in fact, it can be shown that if you have any such function epsilon, then using this formula, you will construct a slowly varying function, right? So this is a nice recipe to construct slowly varying functions, right? In fact, the proof, which is written here, is just some rescaling property and then using the dominated convergence theorem. So it's not, Nothing too deep, but it, it gives you a formula to produce your own slowly varying functions. Okay. Okay. So, uh, as I said before, uh, can be shown that uh, this this limit uh, in the regular varying definition holds uniformly in the parameter lambda in some sense, right? So, what is this sense? Well, if alpha is positive then the limit holds uniformly on any uh, on any set uh, of the form of 0, 0,a. If alpha is 0, then it holds on any compact set a, b, right, bounded away from 0 and bounded away from infinity. And if alpha is negative, then it holds uniformly on d, infinity, right? So set bounded away from 0. And moreover, you have some asymptotic equivalence to uh, some monotone function, right? So for example, when alpha is positive, you're asymptotically, the function is asymptotically equivalent to the running, uh, the running supremum and the future infimum. Uh, whereas if alpha is negative, then you're asymptotically equivalent to the future supremum and the running infimum, right? So what I mean by running infimum is that if you have the full path of the function, like kind of like so, then the running supremum is essentially looking at the largest value you've ever had and it will not update until you have new supremes, right? <laughs> and the running infimum has a similar definition. It will be instead of this process. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, all the way here. Go down, right? Uh, and it stays there until you find new infimums, right? Okay. So uh, this means that uh, if alpha is not zero, your function in particular is asymptotically equivalent to a monotone function, right? And this turns out to be nearly characterizing regular variation as we will see in some later theory. Okay. Um, uh, yes, I did not uh, define this till the definition uh, until later, which is not good, but I will write F till the G and say that F is asymptotically equivalent to G if uh, this limit holds, okay? If uh, uh, the limit of f of x divided by g of x goes to one as you take x to infinity, okay? <laughs> and uh, all of this study could also be explored as you take limits to a specific point, say zero, by doing a reparameterization of your functions, right? So later, 
uh, we will have the case of, of zero and uh, we will see some analysis. But most of these results just extend uh, quite naturally to, to that case. Okay. And uh, another result in this area is that if you consider a very relatively pathological slowly varying function L, it doesn't much matter because you can always find an asymptotic equivalent uh, regularly varying function L tilde, which is in fact now C infinity. Okay. And this uh, nice function can be taken to be eventually monotone if the original function was also eventually monotone, right? So you can inherit most of the properties and at the same time be just C infinity. So you can differentiate as many times as you'd like and uh, not worry about anything, right? Oh, almost anything. Right? So uh, these functions have nice properties. So for example, if you take two slowly varying functions, L1 and L2, then it's more or less natural to think that if you add them up, you still have a slowly varying function. If you multiply them, you have a slowly varying function. If you take any power of one of them, you still have a slowly varying function. And if L2 goes to infinity, then the composition of L1 evaluated at L2 of X is also slowly varying. Okay. These all have relatively simple proofs. And uh, this characterization that I will now describe is essentially what I was trying to refer to earlier. So if you have a positive measurable function, L, this function will be slowly varying if and only if, for every positive alpha, there exists both a non-decreasing function and a non-increasing function. The non-decreasing function goes to infinity, non-increasing function goes to zero, such that we have these asymptotics. Okay. So what I mean to say is if you multiply your function by a power, positive power function, I have a mistake here, you should have a minus alpha on the second one. If you multiply by a positive power, uh, your, your function, then you're asymptotically equivalent to a non-decreasing uh, diverging function. And if you multiply with a negative power, <coughs> you're asymptotically equivalent to a non-increasing uh, vanishing function. And if this happens for every power that you have, then your function is slowly varying, right? So in some sense, uh, or philosophically, what this means is that uh, slowly varying functions are exactly what stands in between power functions, right? In some sense. Right? You're right in between them. Of course, you can always find weird functions that are not slowly varying and still have, uh, in some sense, could be thought of as uh, fitting between power functions. Mm -hmm. But these are rare cases. Most of the functions that you can think of and are relatively nice enough will be slowly varying. Of course, cosine, sine, these are not cases, but maybe you get the point. Okay. So uh, one of the main uh, results that you can exploit uh, for slowly varying functions is the fact that they behave really well under integration and uh, under some further restrictions under differentiation as well, right? So, for example, if you need to integrate your function uh, against our function, slowly varying function against our function, then asymptotically, you can work out what this integral is. And as it turns out, the, the rule of thumb is ignore the slowly varying function, just integrate the power, and you get the, what you would expect on the right-hand side, right? So what I mean is here, if you just integrate the power function, we would have this one over alpha plus one, x to the alpha plus one, right? Asymptotically. And it turns out that you can just plug in the slowly varying function there, as if it were never there, right? Uh, this works up, uh, This works for alpha greater than minus one and for alpha more than minus one. Well, this turns out to be integrable at infinity, and the thing that will be uh, regularly varying will be this integral from x to infinity. Okay, as you take x and x closer to infinity. Of course, the right-hand side is now vanishing. Yeah. And in some sense, uh, even if you consider the case alpha equal minus one, this makes sense. So, what do I mean by alpha equals to minus one? Well, here you would understand this as being infinite. So I will just divide by the rest of it. So alpha plus one is zero. So I'll just divide by the slowly varying part and the limit will be zero. Okay. Uh, so, uh, sorry, the limit will be infinity. Okay. So, so why do we have this minus there? I am a little bit. Uh, the minus here? Yeah. Oh, you see, because the function is now evaluated from x to infinity. And uh, this guy. <laughs> That one, okay. Yeah, so, so, in fact, I mean, I could, you can think of this as important absolute value, so it's positive, right? But the x is still alpha to the alpha plus one, not to the minus. Yes, alpha, alpha is negative. 
alpha is smaller than minus one. So alpha plus one is negative. Plus yeah. One. Okay. So it's, it's going to zero, which makes sense, right? That you're removing it. You're shrinking the integration set. Mm -hmm. Yes? So, yeah, I mean, in particular, these functions, not only can I compute them, well, compute them asymptotically, but the right-hand side is regularly varied. So it means that if you integrate against a power function, you're still regularly varied. And as we know, if I had an additional terms of a slow variation, I would just put them alongside the L that I originally had. Right? It's all nice. And even in the case alpha equal minus one, uh, this integral right here, which is what I have on the first limit, will be slowly varied. Right? And the only understanding of, of this limit here is that it will go infinity. Okay. In fact, if you're integrable at infinity, then you have something which is analogous to the second integral, right? So if, if this is finite for some x naught, then uh, this integral will also be, the integral from x to infinity will also be slowly varying, and you will also have this limit. Okay? So in some sense, it's uh, very slowly and somehow slower, right? This happens whether L of X goes to zero or infinity or doesn't have a limit. It's something to, uh, to keep in mind. All right. Uh, so for example, just, just to set an example, if L is a, let's say logarithm, and I have a T to the minus one, then uh, the integral will be log squared, right? If it were one over log, then the integral would be log log. So, it's not quite easy to work out what this integral will be. It's not like a nice rule. Uh, sometimes you can compute it, sometimes you can't. What you can tell is that it will be slowly varying and that these limits will also, somehow it will be uh, growing or decreasing uh, faster or slower, depending on how you think of it. Okay. So, so this, this theorem, parameter <laughs> theorem, is somehow the the main source of uh, the usefulness in this thing also in probability, because usually many conditions that are required for convergence will collapse into a single one. And one of them will somehow imply all the others also hold at the same time, right? So for example, attraction to stable laws and all these things will reduce to a single condition, right, in some sense. So we'll get there. Now, uh, this, this rule, this nice Karamata theorem has somehow a dual. And now for differentiation, which is remarkably harder, uh, which maybe is expected. So if you have a function u of x, that is the Lebesgue integral of another smaller function u, t, which is eventually monotone, <laughs> that after some x naught, the function is eventually increasing, non-increasing, or non-decreasing, non then if the integral function capital U is regularly varying, then so is the density, the derivative, right? Little u of x. And what you do is the same thing as you did with the integrals. You pretend there's no slowly varying function, you just differentiate the power, and then you plug in the slowly varying function again, and this just works, okay? And uh, just as a remark, uh, the case c0 equals zero is to be interpreted as this being a little, right? And what I mean is if you divide by this, the limit is zero. So if this guy has a zero limit, then the other guy will also have a zero limit. That's the only interpretation you can work out, okay? So in some sense, this is a nice nice class, right? You can integrate, you can differentiate with some uh, additional uh, just remark on this uh, eventual monotonicity, and you still stay within the same class. You can compose, multiply, add, you're still in the same class. So it's somehow very nice uh, class of functions, a natural thing to, to look at, even if it doesn't cover just about everything, right? Um, <laughs> and then uh, there's this other very nice result uh, called uh, Karamata's Toberian theorem, which relates uh, what we usually treat as uh, distribution functions, in this case, a generalized distribution function, uh, that is a non-decreasing by continuous function defined on zero infinity, of course, positive, always positive, and uh, it turns out that the regular variation of the function at infinity is somehow dual or equivalent to the regular variation of its Laplace transform at zero, right? So Laplace transform, this, this nice analytical tool, is often or sometimes more easily available than the function itself. And uh, we can still deduce some information about the function using just the, the Laplace transform. In fact, some of the proofs of regular variation or the 
weak convergence of things, go back to the plus transforms converging, and the regular variation is simply implied. I mean, one implies the other, right? They're both equivalent. And the powers are exactly the same. The only difference is that here x is going to infinity and the parameter s here is going to zero, right? And there's, of course, a, a dual in the other direction if you change uh, uh, the limits of x and s, okay? And uh, again, the, the case z0 equal to zero is interpreted as before. That, that means if one of these has a zero limit, when, once you divide by everything that doesn't have the c0, c then we also will, the other one will also have a zero limit, okay? Or we will vanish at infinity, sorry. So I'm not doing, doing okay. So finally, let's get back to probability. So what does this have to do with anything? Well, uh, I'll focus for now on uh, non-negative random variables, but of course this extends in some natural way to signed random variables, which are often the difference of two of these. And I will say that one of these random variables is uh, regularly varying with index alpha. If the tail probability F bar of X which is the final uh, probability here, is a regularly varying function with index minus alpha. Uh, y minus alpha, well, obviously the, the probability needs to vanish, right? So we have a, a positive index here, right? And it could be zero. So it could converge very, very slowly, which means that X will have very heavy tails, right? So in fact, what we usually mean by heavy tails is that these the tail probability uh, goes to zero as a power function smaller than uh, smaller than three, right? So you don't have a second finite second moment. Uh, and this is known as heavy tailed case precisely because you will not have a second moment and you will not be under the regime of uh, Brownian uh, attraction to Brownian motion in some cases or uh, or CLT. These kind of results may break. You could still not have a second moment and still be attracted under the right conditions but it's really much harder. I'll get to that uh, in a second. So uh, now, just some results that are somehow a consequence of this theory of regular variation uh, before, is that if your distribution function is always smaller than one, that means uh, this thing is positive for all uh, real, uh, positive real x, so it doesn't suddenly collapse to zero. <laughs> uh, and if f has a density f, little f, then you have many implications. So essentially these three conditions are almost equivalent, okay? If x times the density z is proportional or syntactically equivalent for alpha times the tail, then little f so density is regularly varying with index minus alpha minus one, and the tail uh, function is regularly varying with index minus alpha, okay? So, if the density is regularly varying with index minus alpha, minus one, then you also have this asymptotic equivalence and the tail is regularly varying with index minus alpha. And the third one, which is why this is not really an equivalence, states that if F bar is regularly varying with index minus alpha and the density is eventually monotone, right, this is the additional condition that we need for differentiation, then the asymptotic equivalence holds and the density is regularly varying with index uh, minus alpha minus one. Right, so uh, and we have some also some some consequences for the moments of, of the random variable, right? For example, any moment larger than alpha is infinite, and any moment smaller than alpha, uh, positive still, which I should have written, will be finite. Okay. Now the case, the exact case of alpha may be finite or infinite. Okay. This depends on the slowly varying component of these tail. Yeah. And moreover, we have some asymptotics for, for, the, for, the, for the F bar, right? Uh, in terms of some trun truncated uh, moments. Uh, more explicitly, X to the power beta times F bar of X is asymptotically equivalent to uh, beta minus alpha over alpha times the truncated beta moment of your random variable X. Okay. So this is, this is the, one of the key uh, steps in showing these many conditions for attraction to stable laws, right? So usually, uh, let's say in the class of Levy processes, you need to check three things, right? Which are philosophically refer to these uh, three series theorem of, of Kolmogorov. And that is to say that uh, large events are somehow rare enough 
the mean is somehow well centered, and the second moment is also nicely controlled, right? But on the regular variation, all of these boil down to a single condition because I can represent these truncated moments. So let's say the truncated variance or truncated second moment in terms of the tail distribution. So if I assume that the tail is regularly varying with some nice index and there's some nice balance on the positive and negative half, uh, half line, then uh, the moments I will be able to control, the centering I will be able to control, and I will have simply weak convergence uh, implied more or less uh, directly. Okay. So uh, the the <coughs> the case of uh, attraction to a normal law, so the CLT case, uh, so to speak, will be somehow covered by this truncated variance in this Lindeberg condition, and it turns out that this function here will be slowly varying if and only if uh, that function over there is a little o of the truncated segment, which is a, a looks a bit self-referential, but has to do with all these theorems that I gave you before. Right, but in other words, again, I just need to worry about the behavior of f bar against the power function instead of computing all these integrals. Right, in some sense, this this function will give me all the information I need to see if I'm attracted to normal law or to some other uh, law, stable law. Right, mm -hmm. or maybe so, not safe. Sorry, what goes wrong if f is not eventually monotone? So it can here, yes. yeah, with yeah. the density. Uh, it may not work. So even if you are differentiable and little f is a nice enough function, it may not be regularly varying at all. Right. Uh, somehow the index is right, in some sense, <coughs> but it may not be regularly varying. Right. It could be a weird step function somehow. Right. Or if you or you can smooth it out as well, and still it may fail completely. Right. So so maybe something I should have emphasized more is that this theory of regularly varying functions is for positive functions, right? If you have a signed function, things can go wrong quite quickly, right? I'm, <coughs> I'm evaluating a limit, right? The function evaluated at lambda x over the function of x. If I have changing in signs, dealing with these limits, proving that I have somehow closeness on their sums and their products and their, all these things is harder and usually not, not satisfied anymore. So this positivity assumption is Quite important, and in terms of the density, this is the eventual monotonicity of the density. Yes. Uh, so maybe a, a way to see this is that f itself somehow has a derivative, and the derivative should eventually be positive. Yes, or, or negative. But uh, no, no changes in signs. <coughs> that's that's uh, important. Okay, so. Um, if we consider two independent uh, non-negative random variables, uh, regularly varying with the same index alpha, should by this picture. Oh, uh, no, it's a more perfect. If they both have the same regularly varying index alpha, then uh, the sum x plus y will also be regularly varying with the same index alpha. And in fact, I will have this asymptotics for the tail. So the, the proof is not so hard to work out. It turns out that uh, if the sum uh, <coughs> of them is larger than x, then uh, since there are no negative random variables, then the sum will also be larger than x. And the converse is not so far from being true, provided you have some uh, delta, delta room or epsilon room, as some, some people call it. Later, you take some epsilon to, to, to 0 or to 1, right? Same alpha so, is, not, is not important. Sorry? Same alpha is not important. No, same alpha is important. It's just uh, it's covered not, by it's the... Not important. It's not important. Well, it's true. It's you not important. Use. You will also have this asymptotics. It's just that one of these will be somehow irrelevant to the limit. Uh, yes, you're absolutely correct. Yes. Same alpha is not uh, terribly important indeed. But why, why I want to highlight this relationship is because uh, there, there's a few consequences of this fact. Okay? So, for example, if I take IID copies of X, say X1, X2, and so on, then uh, the sum of them will be regularly varying, okay? And so will be the maximum. And I can have this ex explicit representation for the asymptotics, which is n times the probability, tail probability of x, okay? So in particular, this leads to the first uh, one bad event <laughs> principle, which is to say that uh, clearly, if the maximum is larger than x, since these are non-negative random variables, 
then the sum will also be larger than x, right? So one, the, the events on the right uh, should be containing the events on the left, okay? But at the same time, asymptotically, they're equivalent, which means that if the sum exceeds some level, it's mostly due because the largest of the variables exceeded the level, mostly due to that, right? Uh, and this is the, the one bad event principle, right? One thing going wrong somehow overrules the rest of the possible events. I'm sorry, in this case, you're thinking of n being fixed, right? And x going to yes, infinity. Yes, n is fixed, uh, x is going to infinity, yes. That's right. Yeah. Yes, now, if, if you're moving things, you need to be very careful. Yes, there's actually some study about uh, regular Levering functions in many parameters, but this is a very touchy subject. It's not so easy as the real case, let's say, as one parameter functions. Uh, even if you have asymptotic equivalence in this sense, if you're now moving even if you had also the relationship for fixed x and moving n, it's not clear what can happen if you're moving n and x at the same time, right? Uh, all these things can break down quite quickly. It's a, it's a delicate thing in that, in that sense. Um, okay, so uh, another relationship that's also uh, useful is, uh, so sometimes we somehow have to deal with the product of random variables. And it turns out that these closeness properties also more or less well behaved uh, on the regular variation. So more explicitly, if you have uh, random variables x and y, which are independent and non-negative, then uh, some regular variation will imply that even the product is regular variation, uh, is regularly varying, right? So for example, if x and y are both regularly varying with the same index alpha, then so is the product x and so on. As uh, they said before, it's not too important that they have the same index alpha. But uh, a weaker way of saying this is that if one of them is regularly varying with index alpha and uh, the other one has slightly more moments than alpha. So, for example, if y was regularly varying with a larger index, strictly larger index, uh, then the product will also be regularly varying with a smaller index alpha. And you will have these tails and products. Right? The probability of the product being larger than x is asymptotically equivalent to the y moment of uh, y, uh, the alpha moment of y, sorry, times the tail probability of x. Okay? So, so these asymptotics somehow uh, paint the story for the domain of attraction of stable laws and all these uh, nice things. And these models, for example, arise in these uh, things called vervat per perpetuities. I don't know if anyone's heard of them. So essentially, they solve like a linear equation, but just in distribution, right? So x is equal in distribution to, let's say, x times y plus another random variable, where all these variables are independent. So these things arise in many things, actually, even in uh, the story of, uh, sorry, in the theory of interest rates. And uh, heavy tailed properties can sometimes be deduced from the finiteness of moments of, of y, right? For, for the solution of these uh, perpetuities. And uh, on the other hand, the theory of, of extremes, uh, like you can see here in this maximum or this one here, sometimes also reduced to regular variation of the tails of the, of the random variables underneath the whole model. Okay. So, I uh, I finished a bit earlier than I expected. I can get back too quickly, but uh, I will. Then the next lecture, I'll I'll discuss. Why? I mean, I, I said something in the in the talk, which was that the slowly varying function can affect a lot the convergence rate of these in these weak limits, and I think that even though the uniformity in uh, so this, even though uh, this limit is uniform, and even the speed in some sense has been long studied, I think it had been understudied for a long time. And maybe it's because Karamata himself somehow abandoned the field after some time. Uh, but it, we recently picked it up and, uh, well, more people than just me picked it up recently. And uh, we somehow noticed that uh, the speed at which this uh, convergence falls uh, can affect quite a lot the, I mean, in, in probabilistic terms, the convergence of random variables to their attraction. Okay. So what I mean to say is, uh, for example, if you, your function is truly a power function, right? If you need to scale your process by simply a power function to get attraction, likely that means that the convergence will be fast, maybe polynomial, right? 
the, the polynomial may depend on the, the, the power of the polynomial may depend on alpha, but it's usually polynomial. And they're relatively nice assumptions. However, if you have a slowly varying function in there, however slow, the convergence will be necessarily slow, or almost necessarily slow. Uh, and for example, you can have a triple log, like log, 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 something that numerically you will never see in your computer because you need too many iterations to see. And yet, it has enough effect to make the convergence slow. It's lower than logarithm, in fact. You cannot beat logarithm. Okay. And it doesn't matter if the log, log, log is somehow going to infinity or if you're dividing by the log, 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 it will have a very, very strong impact on the convergence, even if it's almost invisible to the, to the human eye or the mm, computer, right, simulations. So these convergences, uh, the speed of these convergences, even though it's uniform, it may be very, very, very slow, right? Okay, we'll see, we'll see what he does about that in the next talk. Okay. Okay. Thank you.